Okay, uh, this lecture is going to be about the evidence that we have to show us evolution. So we use four different types of evidence to support this theory of evolution. Uh, the types that you that can see on the screen will be fossils, uh, we use comparative anatomy, embryology, and comparative genetics or uh, the study of DNA. So let's start by looking at fossils and, and how this is a evidence for the theory of evolution. Uh, first off, what is a fossil? A fossil is any preserved remains or evidence of an ancient organism. It could be uh, ranging from bones that were left here after the organism died. Uh, maybe they were buried amongst uh, layers of sand and silt um, or rock, uh, volcanic uh, magma. Uh, maybe it is a uh, footprint that was, again, covered and, and fossilized. Maybe it was uh, artifacts, uh, remains of uh, uh, evidence that, that an organism did exist. Um, that's what a fossil is, and it's preserved uh, and, and still remains today. You can see over on the right-hand side of the screen, um, here's a, a fossilized bone from this uh, uh, whale, dolphin-looking organism that was once here on Earth. So what is this? Um, how is this evidence, or what does this evidence show us? First off, um, it does provide us information about life on Earth um, years and years ago. Uh, it gives us, you know, some age information. As, as things die and get buried, uh, layers of the Earth allow us to, to create timelines of when things existed and how old certain um, fossil remains are, uh, the type of animal uh, that it might be, or how it's related to those that are currently on Earth and location of, of living things on Earth and, and what kind of interpretation we have of that. Um, as we sort of put the puzzle together. Uh, this, so this evidence does show us and illustrates um, what earlier forms of certain animals might have looked like or did look like based on its um, uh, structures. It does help us show uh, this transition from one form into another of, of these certain animals or of certain species. We call those uh, transitional fossils. And it's a, a way of giving us a timeline on how things have changed in a particular animal. Another piece of evidence that we use to support evolution or evolutionary theory is comparative anatomy. Now, uh, this kind of goes right in conjunction with uh, fossil evidence um, since what comparative anatomy is is the study of similarities and differences between the physical traits of organisms. Uh, we can do that uh, just as easily with uh, organisms that are still alive. Uh, different species of organisms and, and different lineages that we've seen and, and be able to witness in our lifetime. We're also able to imagine what some of these fossil animals uh, would have looked like as well. So we can compare them as well and some of their physical traits. So uh, in terms of evidence, what does this provide us? Um, if we take a look at similarities and differences between organisms, let's say uh, those that have a backbone, we call them vertebrates. If we look at vertebrates, they all seem to have similar bones. So what does that show us? It shows us that you know if they have similar bones, that must mean they come from similar ancestors. And over the course of time that we see them uh, being shaped differently because of where they live and what job they picked up in their environment and uh, what they're best built for. Um, on the screen you'll see it is just shaped differently for their specific niches so the the bones are are different now um, that analysis comes by looking at things like homologous structures homologous structures are uh, physical structures for physical, physical traits of organisms that have um, different mature forms in different organisms um, but developed from the same embryo uh, embryonic tissue so you'll you'll see on the screen here um, a picture of different appendages. Um, notice that the bone structures um, are, are similar. Uh, they come from the same embryonic tissue, but definitely have different mature forms um, in those different organisms. We could also use um, analogous structures. Analogous structures being structures that function alike but are made up of parts that don't share any common ancestry in terms of evolutionary history um, or share the same embryonic tissue for the most part. And we can see a picture coming in now that shows us that. Um, you'll see the different um, structures that look alike but f are, and function alike but are made up of different parts and don't share that same history. And finally, um, our vestigial 
structures and vestigial structures are leftovers from history uh, as a structure that serves no apparent useful uh, function in an organism um, but still exists um, similar to our human appendix uh, and then the, the picture you're about to see here the picture shows what's left of a hip structure from a whale uh, you can see the femur bone and the pelvis bone right there obviously remnants uh, from when they were still walking on land All right, let's take a look at the type of evidence that we're going to call embryology. Uh, embryology is simply is the study of the development of organisms from fertilization to birth. So we're looking at how things develop once they are conceived. This provides us uh, with evidence that shows that many different organisms develop in similar fashions. You can see the uh, picture on the screen right now shows uh, five different organisms and how they develop uh, from embryo. Uh, to fetus and you can see the similarities in the first few stages until um, or uh, later in development uh, hinting at there's some connection uh, between these organisms okay so look at this slide and see if you can figure out which one of these is the human embryo as we said that by looking at the pictures of different embryos from different organisms uh, they all seem to develop in similar ways which means that really shows us that the, uh, there's a common ancestor along the way and in, in this, this type of development uh, is pretty common. So hopefully I've had time to take a look at these pictures and, and the answer you're looking for is C. C is the human embryo. It's interesting because you look at it, it looks like you know, it has a, a curved spine, looks like a tail of some sort, maybe it uh, looks more like a fish, but you see the same thing here. And uh, you see the same curvature there, uh, same head development here, development here, and here. So, anyways, C is the winner. Okay, let's talk about comparative genetics next. Uh, comparative genetics simply is looking at the molecules of life and how they function and how are they uh, and how they're related to one another. Now, this field of evidence seems to be uh, the one that has sent. Uh, the support of evolutionary theory to that next level because we're able to look back in time and, and recover some of these molecules that don't deteriorate real fast. So these could range from the actual DNA itself um, in short sequences of DNA all the way down to just being able to recover pieces of the protein associated with those living organisms. I think that the key to comparative genetics is a, a way of showing evolution is the understanding that evolution is um, really about a genetic change that has uh, occurred and been passed down over the course of a long period of time. So it's a genetic change in, in an entire population over a long period of time. Well, if that's the, the case, these genetic changes come right from the DNA. So it goes back to the concept that we covered earlier this year about DNA um, how and how it gets down into the actual organism. So we have the DNA, which codes for all the traits in an organism, it gets transcribed into RNA, it gets uh, translated and uh, put together, amino acids get put together, and when those amino acids are finally put together, they get finalized into a, a molecule we call protein. So if we pick up any of these um, downstream from DNA, we should be able to make a really good inference and tie into what the genetics really did look like. So we're uh, as a way of showing uh, evidence for for evolution and the fact that um, it is an evolutionary change based on a, a genetic mutation that randomly happened uh, that got passed on all the time, we should be able to, to see that in all these things. All right, so what kind of evidence does this show us uh, or how does it support um, evolutionary uh, theory? Um, it does hint at the fact that all organisms are made up of similar molecules like we looked at anatomy you know all vertebrates were made up of similar bones now those similar molecules don't always look alike but they show us some links and some traces backwards in in time and how they're all um, seem to be related to one another even though they may have a different function at the end um, but it could be molecules like protein or like DNA um, we can took, take a look at the DNA and uh, protein and, and amino acid sequences and we can see things like um, there are just very little differences in the amino acid sequences between living organisms 
um, it shows that you know there there has to be some similar um, similar history um, as we pass down those genes and amongst living organisms. So that shows us that there is uh, some some support for a common ancestor. Um, the least amount of differences in those amino acid sequences, the more closely uh, the organisms would be related. So here's an example of comparative genetics or how comparative genetics would be used. Um, uh, here's a, a, a chart um, where we see here's some species that we want to see how maybe evolutionarily they're connected. Um, this is some a sequence of amino acids in the same part of the same type of molecule. So we're taking our same type of protein. So we're taking a look at hemoglobin protein and uh, we're seeing how they're structured. So we'll, we're able to compare the actual order of amino acids. And, and like we said before, the ones that are have the least amount of differences between each other seem to be more closely related. So we're able to take a look at how closely related a horse is to a human or a human is to a gorilla. And you can see on the screen the difference between a gorilla and the human seems to be one amino acid in the sequence, at least as the short amount we have. So look at this chart right here. Uh, it compares species to the amino acid differences compared with human hemoglobin. And I want you to answer the question, which organism is more closely related to humans? So when you take a look at this chart, uh, the gorilla has one amino acid difference. The lamprey eel has 125 amino acid uh, differences in there. So uh, we would assume that the, the number of di the lower number of differences means that they're a little bit more or they're closer related. So the gorilla would win. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. We uh, discussed the four types of of uh, evidence that we use to support uh, the theory of evolution and natural selection, uh, those being the fossil record, embryology, comparative anatomy, and comparative genetics.